Hello everybody, thank you very much for attending this session on business models and procurement. Uh, I'm Paul Rouse, uh, employed within the Giant organization based in the UK. Um, my role is Chief Communication, Community Relations Officer uh, with Jean, uh, but here I was task leader within uh, task 12.2 and um, in particular I had a, a legacy responsibility within the Giant organization for procurement, hence my involvement. As we go through the presentation, I'll invite my colleagues who are involved in this uh, project to, to invite them uh, introduce themselves. And uh, as we've seen with the rest of the sessions in the uh, EOS Hub Week, this will be recorded. Um, so please don't activate video or microphones in, unless uh, we uh, give you permission. In terms of the approach to questions during this session, we're going to use the chat functionality within Zoom. We've structured the agenda to build in uh, a number of breaks there. So uh, there's a few segments uh, we'll go through and introduce an opportunity for questions. We'll keep an eye on time, uh, may choose to take some of the questions rather than the end uh, as opposed to that section. So we'll just handle that as we go. But please, if you have a, a question, raise it through the chat functionality. Okay, so what we'd like to cover with you today, a brief introduction to myself in terms of what this task is all about, um, and then very much it's focused around the use of case studies. Uh, and I'll explain why we're focusing uh, on the use of case studies just shortly, but uh, we're gonna look at three particular case studies around the use of vouchers to distribute access to resources, um, the concept of virtual access as a funding mechanism within the Horizon 2020 program, to enable uh, consumption at three of the point of use, and then a model uh, where one entity can act on behalf of others to aggregate demand and provide uh, provision resources, services for use uh, on the data sets. Um, we'll highlight a few key conclusions, and then at the end, we'll just explain how this particular task is going to go forward. So there's an opportunity for you to engage, provide some feedback and, and input. So, in terms of what the, the focus and activity uh, by the parties who are involved in this activity, and you can see the identity of those organizations involved, is made up of three parts. The first part has completed now and resulted in deliverable 12.1, and this was to provide uh, an analysis of demand within the research education community environment for cloud services and resources to support uh, research. Um, it also took uh, an element of time to focus on the business models, how those resources could be provided. That's been produced. Um, then sequentially, the intention was that uh, being informed by these demand identification, actual procurement activity would result and uh, we would pilot different procurement techniques, uh, outcomes to uh, provide some purchasing frameworks that would be available for use by the community. And then finally, there would be an appropriate opportunity to do some reflections, review, uh, and provide some feedback as what worked well and what could be done in, in further projects. Now, as you'll all be aware from participating in EOSC activity or interested in EOSC activity, there's lots happening, lots changing, and there have been a couple of pertinent things that have happened that have impacted on our particular task. That's the formation of the EOSC governance and the working groups, in particular, the sustainability working group, which has started to produce a number of documents. I think many of you would know them as the straw man, the teen man, tin man, or I think then indeed in, in due course, the iron lady will appear. Um, they provide input and insight into the legal vehicle, how the uh, provision of resources, services for the community's use will be made available through the financing and the governance, regulatory and policy considerations. That's very pertinent to the work that we're doing. Um, furthermore, there's been a, a parallel project called OCRA, Open Clouds for Research Environments, which very much has as its focus engagement with commercial cloud providers, be they in uh, the infrastructure as a service, um, perhaps platform or service, but also earth observation. So there's very much active procurement work underway there. The net effect of this when we were deliberating our work uh, and activity was in stage two, rather than undertaking further procurement work, which perhaps is already being met and satisfied by the activities under OCRA, we would take the opportunity to review uh, through the use of case studies, what's happened out there in related projects to inform 
the EOS governance and particularly the sustainability working group with this deliverable 12.2, uh, which will be a written study looking at uh, key experiences from work already done or work underway. Now, in doing this, um, I think it's a common expression that most have heard of this concept of the data lake. So this is a repository all across Europe where the fair data will exist, it will be identified, how it will be stored, access is all under this scope and, and, and discussion of a number of related EOS projects. But particularly for us in our activity, we wanted to think about how people access the data in this lake. So we have constructed our, our, our document uh, and it'll soon be available and Sergio will tell you at the end how you can receive a copy of that or, or interact with us on that uh, written outcome is we've added some perspectives we thought it's important to look at the use of the content of this data lake from the perspective of a researcher wherever they may exist an actual institution perhaps a university or in this concept of a demand aggregator and one of the case studies uh, presented shortly uh, will explain what we mean by a demand aggregator and thinking for what we've seen for early deliverables about the EOSC legal entity itself it may be a potential that the legal entity conducts itself as this demand aggregator in amassing requirements across our community for resources to work with the data sets and provision those for use by that community in, in one single place. So a little bit about uh, a bit more of the content, what we've taken and methodology in the approach. So considering those perspectives that I've just described of the researcher and institutional demand aggregator, the things that are pertinent to the procurement and business models is about how easy is it to access the resources and services. So it's not about the data, the focus of this, it's all about the resources and services, be they storage, compute as examples. We wanted to very much uh, test and consider how the ambition of making those services free at the point of use could be realized. Many of the consumers of resources to work with uh, the data lake will be subject uh, to procurement regulations. So the procurement directive is important, as well as financial standards. And financial standards here, the one that particularly will come up, you'll hear about, and I think we've heard about yesterday as well, in another presentation during this week is around VAT, sales tax. Um, EC funding, Horizon 2020 rules, uh, is, is an also, also considered to be an important test. And like all good job descriptions and other activities, we have a, a catch-all other perspective as well. So anything that we thought was particularly pertinent. So with those perspectives and these tests, these criteria, we have identified three at the moment and we're working on a fourth. Uh, scenarios or case studies where we have had experience across the community um, where we can look at these criteria and determine how effective these case studies have been in achieving these outcomes or against those criteria. The aspiration being then that there are learning and key conclusions which I'll summarise at the end of this presentation can be taken forward by the sustainability working group as they inform and further focus and develop this structure and operation of, of EOSC. So the four case studies that we're going to cover, I want to look at vouchers, virtual access mechanisms, demand aggregator, and one that we can't talk about today, but very much is still in our, in our eye, is to look at an arrangement where public, public arrangements exist with a, an expectation of cost recovery. So one public entity will sell services to another public entity and expect to recover their costs. How that can comply with those tests that we've identified. That's really the scene setter and end of the introduction. Uh, just looking at the chat, I can see that there are no questions at this point. So that's working quite well in terms of, of, of time in, in our agenda. Um, so thank you for your time and interest. I hope you stay on. Uh, I'd now like to hand over to, uh, to two colleagues uh, who are going to cover the case study around vouchers. It's broken up into two parts because we've had experience of two instances of vouchers. So for the first instance, uh, I'd like to invite Marion from CERN to uh, introduce herself and, uh, and share with you the findings there. Marion, please. Thank you, Paul. So hello, everyone. My name is Marion. I'm working at CERN as a project analyst. And as Paul mentioned, I'll explain a bit uh, more on the case study number one, which is around voucher. And I think I can, yeah, Exactly, I can control the slides. Yeah. Um, 
so we start, I'm going to start to talk about the Etch and Cyclot project because this is where we began to explore the use of vouchers to provide access to uh, cloud resources to research environments. So just some key facts about the project to give some context. Etch and Cyclot is a pre-commercial project, pre-commercial procurement project that started in 2017 and ended last year, 2019 with a procurement budget of 5.3 million euros. It was led by CERN and it grouped 10 um, leading research organizations in Europe. You can see them on the map on the right of my slide. And together, those organizations put some money to, to procure in this project. So they formed the bias group of this project. Um, Edge and Cyclad was successful. Uh, it won an award for outstanding innovation in ICT procurement um, from the Procure Plus. So going more into details of the, the project in itself, um, the core activity of the project was to pilot a hybrid cloud platforms for the research community. And those were provided in the pilot phase of the project by two uh, providers that were competitively selected throughout the Edge and Cyclad project. So those two uh, providers were Exoscale uh, in a consortium led by RIA and T-Systems. And what happened in the, in the pilot phase of the project is that CERN, as the lead buyer, um, procured on behalf of those 10 organizations that I mentioned earlier, large-scale services uh, to, to test and use those two hybrid cloud platforms. So that was really the core of the project. Now on a, on a side or another view of the project, a side activity was coming out of a decision of the project partners to um, dedicate some of the procurement budget, not to use the, the platform at a large scale usage, but to, to procure vouchers. So we're talking about roughly 8% of the procurement budget. So this gives us about um, 400,000 euros that was procured as vouchers. The project partners decided to do that um, for two main reasons. The first one, it was to lower the entry barriers uh, to cloud services to uh, end users, um, and especially for the long tail of science. So to users that are not necessarily using cloud services um, before using the vouchers. And the second objective was to provide um, services to the end users of those 10 uh, research organizations so that they could use services that are not uh, necessarily available within their organization. So I'm talking about um, different architectures such as GPUs, FPGAs, but also uh, software such as TensorFlow, uh, things like this. So looking at the process very quickly, uh, what we did is that Together with the, with the bias group, those 10 uh, organizations, we defined, it, defined the characteristics of the voucher schemes. So talking about the face value of the voucher, validity, things like this. Then Exoscale and T-System provided this scheme based on those characteristics, and they gave us some vouchers so that we could test the schemes. The bias group made some tests, gave feedback, the feedback was integrated. And then we started distributing vouchers to end users. Then we wanted to collect feedback on the experience. So we distributed an online form uh, to those users. And based on this feedback, we drew some lessons learned that we uh, documented and the document is published on the Nodo publicly available. So I don't have time to go through all the lessons learned that we identified during this project, but I'll highlight a few. And as I said, the, all of them are documented and I did the link in this slide at the back. Um, but the first um, point that I wanted to highlight is that we really saw from the feedback that the user, they need a simplified user interface when they access the cloud platform with their voucher and up-to-date documentation and trainings because not all of them are used to uh, use cloud services. They, they need a simple environment where they can navigate. They were also very keen on having cost calculators because um, they wanted to understand what they could use, which services they could use and how much with the face value that they had with their voucher. Then a um, um, point that we identified is that sometimes, even though the users were keen on using cloud services via the vouchers, they couldn't because this was not compatible with their data management plan. So this is something to, to take into account. 
And finally, they were really keen on having a clear policies at the start about what's going to happen uh, to their data once the voucher is exhausted and where they could store the data after using the voucher. So they were looking for long-term data storage solution. So those are four points um, that I thought was worth to highlight uh, from the feedback. But what I really want to stress is that we observed that the, the end users and the users of the vouchers, they found that the vouchers were really uh, a good way to start using cloud resources. So one outcome of, this, of the HNC Cloud project is that voucher scheme is a good mechanism to encourage new users to use vouchers. It's maybe not the most efficient mechanism when we, when we talk about sustained uh, large-scale usage of cloud services, but for a small project that are defined in time and for engaging new users, it's very efficient. So what we did is we brought this idea of vouchers in the Okra project. Um, Paul talked about this project in the, in the introduction. So Okra started this year and it's a project to uh, encourage, uh, to do procurement of commodity cloud-based services for the EOSC. So bringing vouchers as a way to introduce um, new, use, new users to cloud services was very relevant here. Um, so just a few facts about the project before I go on describing what we did with vouchers in this project. Um, the Okra project is led by Giant, um, CERN, RIA Group, and Trustatia are members of the project. And it has a procurement budget of 9.5 uh, million euros. And bringing this idea of vouchers based on the lessons learned from HNC Cloud, um, Giant, as a lead um, partner of the project, ran a call off in summer 2019. Under the Giant IAS framework, so under the existing uh, framework, in the Netherlands. And the aim was to procure a total amount of 500,000 euros as vouchers. The outcome was that three uh, providers were selected to provide voucher. There was one uh, Azure reseller, one AWS reseller, and one independent service provider, which is Cloud Sigma. And um, once we had this voucher, the aim was to distribute it to a new user, to the long tail of science. And to do so, uh, we identified three distribution channels, which is Eurodoc, the European Council for um, Doctorate uh, Candidates, the MCAA, which is the Marie Curie Alumni Association, which, is, which regroups, which groups um, all the researchers that either benefited from or are currently benefiting from Marie Curie grant under the European Commission program, and the EOS Cup. So the two um, first programs, uh, first channels were coordinated by CERN. So I'm gonna talk about it in the next slide. And then the last one was coordinated by AGI. So I, leave, I, I will leave my colleague, Matty, to talk about it at the end of this presentation. So going on with what we did, um, or how we distributed uh, vouchers to the MCAA researchers and Eurodoc researchers. We started by um, creating a survey um, in order to gather the requirements from those uh, researchers. Uh, we really wanted to understand whether the researchers were currently using cl cloud services, um, whether they, were, they wanted to use some if they, if they were not using some, um, what would prevent them to use cloud services. So really to understand the full scope um, of the, the full, the overview. This was also a, one of the objectives of the Okra project. This was done very early at, uh, in the project uh, in quarter two, 2019. So before the call off for vouchers was run. The results um, were analyzed. We had 72 valid answers and we documented the outcome in a document that is publicly available. And I added the link there so you can have a look. Following this uh, action of, of collecting the requirements, we started the distribution because we had the vouchers in hand as uh, Giant ran the call off in summer. And we started in November uh, last year, 2019. The candidates uh, had to apply 
via an online form to, to get vouchers. And they were selected directly by Eurodoc and MCIA representatives based on um, selection criteria that were previously defined. As of today, uh, we distributed 15 Cloud Sigma vouchers. We are expecting to distribute more in the following weeks as we have currently a uh, call for application running and we got uh, applic more application for Cloud Sigma vouchers. So this number is expected to increase in the coming weeks. We distributed five AWS vouchers and two Azure vouchers. And those numbers are quite low for AWS and Azure vouchers as the distribution of those vouchers had to stop in January 2020, so shortly after we started the distribution, because there was a VAT issue in the procurement process, which was affecting the distribution of the vouchers to end users in different countries. And regarding the feedback, we plan to collect feedback uh, from the users. Uh, we were planning to collect it already at this time of the project. However, this also has been delayed due to this uh, VAT issue I mentioned. So we will now uh, collect it in quarter three, 2020. And again, we plan to document it and share it with the community. So now we'll leave the floor to Matty so he can explain more about this VAT issue I just mentioned. And he will also give more details on the EOS Cub channel and what was done there. Okay, uh, thank you, Marian. So I'm uh, Matti Heikkunen, and, and in addition to working for the Work Package 12 in the EOS Cub, I'm, I'm also the innovation manager of the of the of the project. So, so I, I think these sort of business models and so on they, they actually fit quite well together. So, in a way, the the vouchers and the VAT issue was a essentially a bit of a surprise because the the cross-border VAT treatment of the vouchers that was clarified, I think, understood first of uh, January 2019. So it's quite a recent thing. So in, in, in the end, what, what came us as a bit of a surprise is that the, the place of consumption or, or in VAT terms that will be the place of supply is actually the country where the, where the user resides, not where the server resides. And, and it, 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 in a small scale pilot, this is of course sort of additional unbudgeted effort for the cloud providers because they need to undertake the VAT accounting for each of the countries and, and track the information and so on. And uh, to make matters maybe a little bit more difficult to, to resolve is, is that the distributor cannot determine the place of consumption with a certainty. I, I mean, if you get an email from somebody from, uh, from a certain domain, it, it is basically up to this person to tell that, okay, which country he considers to be resident in. So the I understood that the, the actual service provider has certain certain sort of exemptions in a way that you you can make reasonable assumptions, but distributing distributed channel saying that okay, this person is here doesn't necessarily qualify for that. So this is something that it, in the end it's something that the cloud providers need to need to manage and budget for and, and so on. So then that is something that is sort of ongoing the discussion about and, and, and how to do this in an optimal way. And of course, uh, if you scale up the number of vouchers, then, then the overhead goes down. It, it was basically just sort of slowing down, as, as Marion said, in this sort of initial stage when you have a small number of vouchers and you're kind of trying to figure out how to do this. It was sort of additional thing that, uh, that delayed the pro progress quite a, quite a lot. Uh, but uh, I think it's not an necessarily an unsolvable problem, but something that uh, actually part of the work package 12 work will need to look into in more detail. And then if you go to the next slide, um, there was sort of a couple of learning experiences related to this uh, uh, EOS hub as a consortium, uh, not a legal entity acting as a distribution channel. Uh, and these were sort of similar thing, nothing that is not unsolved, that can't be solved, but it's just sort of uh, quite a lot of uh, effort of, of analyzing the terms of conditions that the user accepts and, and to understand that, okay, are the EOS Cub partners also sort of covered by the same liability release as, as the other, other parties in this? So, so we did some, some work there and it actually contacted the service provider and so on. Then when it comes to the user support, we actually had two batches of vouchers. One of them were sort of experienced users who know what to, what to expect and, and, and with them, they, they, they were sort of uh, delivered as is. So they, they, they would contact for the support, for example, directly with the vendor. And then the other one, which is through the marketplace, 
So we, we actually did the, we have done the, most of the onboarding process and, and then you run into these interesting questions in a, in a way that who is the service provider because it, it is sort of uh, on one hand you have the EOS Cub help desk and EOS, EOS Cub user support being ready to provide provide sort of uh, additional support and, 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 and just sort of forcing this sort of slightly non-standard uh, let's say service provider in, into, into the system that, uh, that again was something that required a little bit of thinking but uh, I, I think again something that uh, once you have done it once I think it's going to be quite easy to replicate this and so on so so uh, so yeah I, I think uh, this is this is sort of uh, more or less the, the additional lessons learned that we we are going to work on for the rest of the project plan and and and, and come up with the model in the, in the final delivery so that was more or less what we had for the vouchers if I understood so I see you have one question in the chat. Thank you, Matty. Thank you, Marion. Okay. Um, so we've heard there that uh, that vouchers have been applied. Uh, they've had some positive effects and benefit, but uh, there are some challenges in how they're actually configured. There's perhaps some overheads that need to be understood around VAT mm -hmm. uh, and configuration of liabilities in the contractual relationships that uh, are involved by the, the links in the supply chain in order that uh, a researcher, the end user, can consume resources. Um, so thank you. We'll just take a couple of minutes to see if there's any questions. I can see Mark made a su suggestion. I think we'll, we'll take that one offline. Thank you for your suggestion. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a question here from Yuri. Uh, Yuri says, does this mean that EOS will not advise researchers to use AWS or Azure? This doesn't reflect real use of cloud services by uh, academia in research. Do vouchers have monetary value? Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll respond to, to that in the first instance. Um, Yuri, uh, absolutely, that's not the case. There's, there's not a recommendation that um, AWS or Azure should not be used. Uh, I can tell you and you're here. Shortly from uh, Hilka, uh, there's millions of euros being consumed through those very platforms at the moment by research education users all across Europe. So that's certainly not the recommendation from this report. It was just particularly the providers and the engagement in this pilot in Okra for the first use of vouchers for stimulating demand in the long tail of science where we had a, a surprise, uh, to use the words of the presentation of the learning about a particular VAT uh, directive and EC directive on the use of vouchers which traditionally the VAT needs to be accounted at the point of supply here in this instance there's a whole lot more administration around it being accounted by uh, for the place at which it is consumed and those suppliers weren't in a position able to do that um, because they were engaged for a different basis so we had to suspend those two particular resellers there's to be absolutely clear there is no message in suggestion that AWS or Azure shouldn't be used. And indeed, they are available to many r and &E users already through the, the existing IaaS frameworks and through the Okra uh, program. We've just launched a, a new tender as well to refresh those frameworks and make available these services on an ongoing basis. So that's, uh, that's hopefully answered that one very clearly. Uh, typically, the vouchers do have a, a monetary value. Uh, Marion explained in the, in the slides there, HNCI Cloud allocated one particular value. Uh, for the vouchers that are available still under Okra, uh, we're sampling with different sizes of, of voucher value to get some experience about what the, the best or the optimum value is for a voucher for a typical research scientific application to get the benefit for the researcher, i.e. that they can fund a typical engagement uh, as appropriate. Is 200 euros insufficient? Is 1,000 excessive? We're, we're, we're learning what that uh, distribution is unit value is through the project and if i may add uh, paul please Mary. i think yeah due to the fact that vouchers uh, in the two projects had a monetary monetary value it was very helpful uh, that the providers could provide cost calculators because the researchers really need to understand how much they can use with those 250 euros 500 euros um, as we don't provide the vouchers as an access to this type of VM for that time of that much time, the cost calculators are really interesting here and really valuable. Baron, we're going to take the liberty. I think we can squeeze in just one more question at this section. Can you pick up the next question that's just come in as well, please? 
or Matty, either one of you. Shall I read it out? Can, yeah, please. Can, can, can one voucher be used across resource providers or do you have to have different vouchers for resources from different providers? So, so I was actually just typing, typing a reply. So, so in, in the case of Ocred, the, all the vouchers were always tied to a single resource, uh, resource provider. Yes, and that was the case in the Cloud as well. Okay, thank you. I propose we're moving to, to the next uh, section of our presentation. Here, we're going to hear from our colleague Sergio, uh, I'll allow Sergio to introduce himself uh, just a moment, where we're going to hear about uh, the use of the virtual access uh, funding mechanism within uh, EC funding agreements and how that can be used to best effect to deliver projects in EOSC. Sergio, please. Yes, thank you, Paul. Um, so I'm Sergio Andreazzi and I work for the EGI Foundation and I am the Head of Strategy Innovation Communications and with regards to the EOSCA project, I am also the World Package 12 leader. And uh, so my presentation will cover three main topics. So the first one will, I will for those of you that, were, that are not familiar with the um, virtual access, I will give a brief introduction. And then I will explain uh, about the experience using this financial mechanism within the Yosca project, and then I will derive a couple of uh, learnings for the, that could be considered for the European Open Science Cloud. So what is virtual access? Virtual access is a financial mechanism that uh, is part, is defined in the context of the Horizon 2020 program, specifically for the work program on the research and e infrastructures. And it is specifically um, associated to uh, certain calls. So it cannot be used in any kind of calls that the EC would publish. The call need to clear, uh, uh, need to mention it in an explicit way. The, uh, it is a complementary mechanism to another one, which is called the transnational access. And uh, I'm just focusing on this because it is the one that was selected in the EOS hub. So the main goal of this mechanism is to stimulate the opening up of research resources or services that can be reached uh, virtually via communication networks outside their own user base. So uh, it can be data sets, it can be portals, it can be kind of, kind of services that in general already been used by a research group, research community. Maybe they are limited to a country, to a small group, etc. But as they, they, there is maybe a wider interest to the European research, the, uh, the goal of this funding is to stimulate uh, free of charge uh, access to new users or to new usage. In general, the mechanism as it is structured, it was designed for services that in general that does not allow, do not need a user selection or do not, do not need a user identification. Uh, although user identification can be technically uh, supported by the service. For instance, you can think about an open data set. And uh, who can use this mechanism? So in the specific grants or calls where this is activated, this can be used by the beneficiaries of the project. So you need, first of all, as an, a provider, you need to be part of the project. What are, bes uh, besides the obligations that institutions have as being part of the beneficiary, being a beneficiary in H 2020 projects. Uh, this mechanism adds some extra uh, uh, obligations if you want to use it to open up your services. And specifically, you need to um, publicly publicize the service. In the context of the IOSC, the IOSC marketplace is the uh, main channel. The service should be already TRL 8. And also there need to be justification and demonstration of uh, the, uh, the service also actively used by new users or new communities. So there's an increased usage. So there, is a, there are metrics to be collected and reported to the C through the project office. And finally, uh, it needs to be open the service to uh, all European and international user communities. So what costs can be reimbursed? So the virtual access mechanism that we adopt in EOSCAB would allow only to reimburse what, they, what is called actual costs and only the operational part of those costs. So in general, you cannot 
if you need to invest more on capital to increase the uh, capacity of the service, the capital expenditure could not be reimbursed. So it's more only the operational part. And all the, the costs that are uh, really identifiable as those needed to, op to increase the access for new users. And uh, I put the link in the slides of a presentation from the EC where you can have more information about this mechanism. Now I move to the experience of the EOSCAB. So EOSCAB, uh, we are using the virtual access in four main series categories. Overall, we have, uh, so we are supporting 38 services provided by 42 partners with an overall budget of 3.8 million of euro. And this category of services are the common services like the more infrastructure layer, uh, like uh, virtual machine management, uh, storage systems, data management services, and so on, the more the horizontal layers. Then we have end thematic services, which are more the scientific specific uh, services that were selected via an open core mechanism during the preparation of the project. And here we can find, I don't know, uh, high-level analytics platforms or science gateways or, uh, that usually are uh, typically a per scientific discipline. And then we have two collaborative services, and uh, that's an important category. Also, we have federation services, and here we mean those services that are needed to enable the hub as a mediator between demand and supply in the context of the YOSCAP project. So in the, if we think about also when on, on a wider um, sense using the more known terminology nowadays, when you hear about the federating core. So those federation services are services that potentially are part of the federating core. This is like say the first implementation of the federating core. So we, have, we find accounting, monitoring services, we have desk and so on. They are not directly used or requested by the users, but they are needed to enable the European Open Science Cloud. So now moving more to the benefits, what we saw as a benefit in using this mechanism, first of all, okay, it was clear that even though only a small part of the cost would be covered, more the operational cost of the uh, marginal cost in court to open up services, the mechanism stimulated the participation of new providers. So there were early adopters, early uh, of the European Open Source Cloud concept who wanted to make the move and also co-found the service provision. Also, it was good to bootstrap the marketplace with a, uh, a wider service offering. And uh, it was, uh, the mechanism was piloted, so we, we acquired experience on how it can be used both for supporting services and for research enabling services. And the community started to develop also expertise in, uh, uh, in, uh, using the mechanism for uh, using the mechanism and also learning how to report. So the measure KPIs, like the number of users, visit on the marketplace, how many countries have been reached out for user satisfaction. And also uh, we collected useful experience for the European Commission because one of actually the key points from the European Commission was to enable this mechanism for the Call that funded the OSCA project was to learn how this could be used in the context of European Open Science Cloud. So with the initial reporting of the experience, already the EC uh, took into consideration uh, the initial experience and introduced the change for the next calls, like the one, the Inflyosk 7 or 3, that for those of you that are familiar, that are, have a deadline in June. So they authorized the virtual access to use also the unit cost mechanism which is, was something all reserved for the transactional access. And both mechanisms in future calls can be combined. Uh, there is also some learnings on how this could be, there are also areas of, of improvements that we learned uh, through the project. First of all, we found out that many providers did not join because uh, the, either the mechanism was incompatible with the national mandate, for instance, they couldn't subsidize uh, the capital part of the investment they needed to do. Also, it was difficult for them, uh, for those providing uh, a paid service to add also free access uh, via virtual access because some adaptations were needed and there was no direct funding to do this adaptation. So the scale 
of the surface provision in the OSCAB was not enough for them to address the needed changes. Um, measuring also the measuring the, the growth for users for some services is not easy uh, because okay the EC says okay you need only to claim the cost that you need to uh, to in extend the access but you cannot claim your current cost sometimes it is it is difficult to uh, have evidence of this uh, the overhead for the project was much higher than anticipated so as a EGF Foundation as a coordinator of the project, we, um, because we need to collect all the, um, all the metrics from the providers and provide reporting to the, um, to the AC. So the low readiness from the providers uh, was, uh, let's say, a barrier to have a more efficient process. And also the guidelines at the beginning were not so clear, so this is also an area of improvement. So my last slide is about the, what, what we can say for the European Open Source Cloud. In general, we can say that, okay, virtual access, it, it is a good mechanism to, uh, because this, first of all, it focuses on providing free services of point of use and also to fund, uh, to stimulate opening up of services. That is the goal of the EOSC. Services and resources, including data. And uh, the possibility of using both actual cost and unit cost is welcome. It will be very interesting to see how this will be used in the future calls. And uh, it will be important to, if they recover the full marginal cost, would be uh, possible, including the capital expenditure that would stimulate more providers. And also better guidelines are needed. And also the providers need to uh, increase the maturity and in also in collecting all the metrics and maybe to automate the cost accounting and the uh, distribution of the metrics to the project office. And with this, I would welcome any questions. Thank you, Sergio. We can see from, from the chat window, uh, from participants, we've had some in interaction in this session. So particularly to, to Patricia, I think she's reinforced with the comments that she's uh, put on there, Sergio, that in her experience in uh, the project called uh, Synthesis, uh, they've had some difficulty in understanding the mechanism around virtual access, whether it's a, a local policy thing or within the actual rules. Um, so it reinforces uh, from the EOS Cub experience of virtual access. Uh, some of the, the experience. Um, Mark had raised a point that in the presentation, the uh, hyperlink to the PowerPoint doesn't work. Um, I think in this presentation now, you're just seeing the visual image of the slide deck from the agenda pages for the EOS Cub Week. Uh, the slides are available there. If you open them through that link, then the hyperlink should work for you. Um, so I believe that's just a technical system thing. I don't. Diego, okay, I, don't I will double check anything. the upper link after and I will fix it. Okay. I, I think that's that's correct in terms of so that. Mark says he's looking at the PowerPoint. Okay, well, we'll, well Sergio's committed uh, to have a look at that offline to make sure that hyperlink's working so you can access that. Okay. Thank you for the interaction. Thank you, Sergio, for uh, for sharing with us our experience and how those uh, relationships can uh, exploit this new uh, form of uh, funding allocation uh, within EC projects. We'll turn now in our presentation to the last of our case studies. Uh, I'll invite our colleague Hilke to present here around this concept we've termed the demand aggregator. What could it possibly do for us in the EOSC world? Hilke, over to you please. Great, thank you very much Paul. So my name is Hielke Koers and I head up the data management services team at the SURF in the Netherlands uh, and I'm also part of this uh, WP uh, work package 12 around business models and procurement. And I have the pleasure to take you through one of the um, case studies where we investigate a bit uh, in detail the dynamics and the potential benefits of demand aggregation. So I'd like to start with just a few remarks around the uh, uh, demand aggregation in general and then zoom into the specifics of, uh, of the case study. So the idea in principle is fairly straightforward. Um, if you aggregate your demands and you bundle your buying power, you should be able to get better outcomes when you are procuring services. 
The most obvious benefit I think to many is price discounts, and of course this is a very important one, but it's not only about negotiating a better price, it's also about overall reduction of the costs involved in procurement, there's a lot of overhead, a lot of administration, you save up on that if you do things together. And also you can realize some service improvements, not only in terms of the price points, but also for example, demanding compliance with a certain set of standards that are desired. So price is important, but it's not the only benefit for demand aggregation. That sounds great. So then you might, if you would enter this territory new, right? You might ask yourself the question, well, if it's so, if, uh, that, that all sounds great, these benefits, why is this not happening all the time? And the answer is that, well, it only applies to certain particular use cases. It needs to be scoped well, and there's also some complications here. So demand aggregation is most suitable for commodity type of service that are fairly standardized and that you can indeed easily roll up to an aggregate level. If there's a lot of specialization involved, this, this method probably does not work well for you. It also requires, and I'll elaborate a little bit on the point through my, uh, my presentation, that there are central parties who are really able to drive the process, mobilize their constituencies, um, and ideally take on a certain amount of risk. So you need those parties in the middle to be able to do this successfully. Finally, there are a couple of non-trivial legal, fiscal, regulatory aspects, um, and also I'll touch a bit upon those in more detail in my presentation. So why are we talking about demand aggregation here? What is the relevance in context of the European Open Science Cloud? Um, well, it has been suggested by many that EOS could potentially play a role of a demand aggregator, or sometimes it's called broker. We have to be careful with the terminology here, so I'll also touch upon that in a little bit more detail in my presentation, but for now, just the message is um, demand aggregator or broker can mean different things, so you really have to be specific about what you mean when you suggest that EOS could be a broker or a demand aggregator. Notwithstanding the uh, semantic confusion, there is definitely potential here for EOS to play such a role. And then of course, we want to learn from past experience about what, exactly what that role would entail and what are the opportunities and what are the pitfalls. So a brief illustration about well, how you can think about demand aggregation. And of course you can aggregate across many different dimensions. I've plotted here the two, I guess, most obvious ones, research domain or country. Um, in the case of research domain, um, and, and the case study that I will be presenting is really about a generic service. It's really um, commodity cloud services, so bare VMs that can then be further um, configured to meet specific requirements. But the service that's procured here collectively is a very generic service, which means that you can aggregate across different research domains. And of course, also over countries. And there it really helps to build scale if you're able to procure uh, crossing the national boundaries. And this has been enabled by this famous European Council Directive from February 2014. Now the interesting thing about this particular case study is actually it does both because it focuses on commodity type um, cloud services, infrastructure as a service, and also it aggregates across countries. So you get a, yeah, basically a two-dimensional um, uh, field of aggregation. So a bit more detail about the case study from a high level. Um, so we looked in depth at the, uh, uh, the pan-European uh, IAS infrastructure as a service standard that was run, run by Géant in 2016. Uh, Marion already alluded to it in, in her presentation, also uh, connecting it to the voucher schema. So it's interesting that uh, these things can be connected. It's not necessarily, necessarily mutually excluded. So started in 2016, um, the uh, Tender and the demand aggregation process was managed by Géant together with the Endrens, the National Research and Education Networks, of which CERP is one, which is how CERP is involved in this. And the outcome is it resulted in aggregated sales in excess of 26.5 million, with 385 institutions across um, Europe benefiting from that. Uh, to come back to Yuri's point, you uh, raised a concern about AWS and Azure. I think they are represented here. Um, so just to underline the point that that's definitely on the table as well for EOS. So the process, again, at a high level, it began by preparing and organizing, and organizing here most notably means gathering the buyers to form a buyer group and, and settling on the requirements and specifications. Then there's the formal tender procedure, which was managed by Géant in their capacity as the central purchasing body, and that resulted in multiple framework agreements. 
um, then to actually start delivering um, the service and the actual service commencement, um, there is a step, which is that the NREN and the service provider needs to sign a service commencement form. Um, and then the participating institutions, which could also be the NRENs, they can start um, to really uh, make use of the offerings and that goes through a call off. Either that's a di direct award if the type of service that is needed exactly matches the specifications in the tender or a mini competition in case there are additional requirements, functional and non-functional, uh, that still need to be uh, settled. And then once the service provider is selected, the institution and the NREN typically work together uh, on the details on the provisioning, but also to help support with training and adoption. So zooming a little bit into the role of the NREN, because we thought that was interesting as really an, an, an enabler of success of this type of scenario. The NREN helps assure that the framework agreements are also in compliance with their national legislation. This is, of course, facilitated by the EU directive, but it's still not trivial, so that needs to be validated and checked. The NREN mobilizes its community such that they have an appetite to, to, to join this international binding group um, and also uh, get engaged in, in the discussions about uh, the requirements and, and uh, uh, the desired specifications. The NREN signs this service commencement form, which is basically giving the green light to start direct contact between service provider and uh, the institutions. Um, and the NREN is a champion of the adoption of service through promotion, education, training, and those type of activities. Now, from a legal perspective, the NREN can assume a variety of roles. Um, so they have a choice in how exactly they want to sit in this dynamics and in this landscape of these different actors. As a referrer, the NREN is mostly you know, behind the scenes um, or orchestrating, mobilizing, but does not have a formal contractual role. The other extreme is the undertaker, where actually the NREN is uh, procuring services from the supplier and then again um, delivering those to their constituency, to, to the institute. So they have a very active role, which means they have more control, more agency, but also carry more risk. And the reseller sits a little bit in between, um, where there is a more immediate connection between supplier and user, but the NREN still has a role to play also contractually. Oh, underwriter, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. <laughs> That's a silly mistake. It's an underwriter, not the undertaker. I'll get that fixed. Apologies. Here it is uh, correctly, fortunately. So in the particular uh, case study that we zoomed in, uh, SurfNet was the underwriter. Um, and in addition to their uh, role in, in, in the process and the contractual, et cetera, they also created a portal, SurfCumulus, which is a value-adding service that essentially helps to drive adoption and usage by making it easier for the, uh, the, the institutes in their constituency uh, to get going and, and actually uh, consume the service. In agreement with uh, Surf members, it was discussed to add a margin to offset the costs that were made in both the procurement process, but also in running this surf cumulus additional service. So a couple of con considerations coming from this case study that are important to bear in mind if we think about generalizing such a model to the EOSC um, uh, scale. Um, the tender process itself is subject to the legislation of the country in which the tender is organized. The framework agreements, the creation of those is subject to legislation of the country in which the framework is drafted. In the case of the Sujayant uh, tender, there was the same, but that's not necessarily so. And then uh, the call of contracts uh, are subject to legislation of the country in which the research organization resides. And also VAT, which was a thorny issue in the voucher uh, scenario, applies in this case in the home country of the research organization that's consuming the service. So in this case, that's fairly, fairly clear cut. So benefits realized. Was this actually a successful model? Um, unfortunately, the exact detailed numbers on the reduced overhead costs are not available for uh, publicly at, at this time. Um, however, previous figures that have been reported to report cost savings of up to 25% or even 33% in Ireland, these have been published before. So I think at least that is gives you a little bit of a, a ballpark figure on the type of, of cost savings that could potentially be realized from, from such a mechanism at scale. So the key question, is this a good model for EOSC? Something that needs to be considered in more detail and needs to be borne in mind. 
I would say in spirit, most definitely it fits very well with the spirit of the European Open Science Cloud, realizing benefits by collaboration at the European level. Um, there's potential for cost saving. I think those reported figures underline that point. And again, not only cost saving, but also really driving the adoption of, of desired standards. Um, and it's, if implemented well, free at the point of use, it's usually the central IT department that uh, pays the bill and the researchers themselves do not need to worry about that. So that also fits with, uh, with what EOSC is all about. Finally, some lessons learned or considerations. Um, like I said in the beginning, the process really works well for services that are indeed very similar commodity, where the overlap in user needs and requirements is high. If you're looking at very specialistic services, this is not going to work. Um, also lesson learned from the experiences with this uh, Jayan framework and how that was deployed, also including uh, the work from, from my colleagues at SurfNet is that the, uh, the benefits realized and uh, in particular of cost saves um, are the greatest when the research organizations that take part in this are really able and willing to commit a sizable proportion. And you really need to make a fist or you need to have some, some clout in order to benefit from this type of clout procurement. The stronger the commitment the research institutes can give to the NREN as an intermediary party, the more powerful that NREN can operate uh, and, and make sure that those benefits are realized. In, in this case, we've also seen that uh, strong national bodies um, in, in, uh, in the process here um, have really helped to manage the progress, organize it, and mobilize their members at the national level. That brings me to the end of my presentation. I would welcome any questions or comments. Thank you very much, Hilke. I think uh, the point that you're making about uh, having a fist to, to make an impact um, for participants, probably many will know that, that the size of the, the IS cloud market is considered, if you sort of Gartner data, around $3 trillion. So um, yeah, for us to have an impact there, uh, doing something at a pan-European scale, uh, we've certainly got the potential. And through this case study, we can already see uh, across Europe where we have aggregated multi-millions of demands that are going through those frameworks. There's an opportunity for us to do something there. Um, one of the particular challenges that uh, I'd just like to, to reinforce and express that you, you, you picked up on there is a technicality around the mechanism for how this procurement is done where one party leads on behalf of a number of parties. Um, in the current procurement directive, there's an obligation to identify all of the potential beneficiaries from that action. Uh, that technically can be quite difficult. A framework may last for four years. If you aren't identified at the start of that, that process, then perhaps uh, it means you're excluded. And the activity of undertaking one of these procurement cycles is a, is a considerable endeavor. So it's not always easy just to add someone back into the list. So to, to apply this at scale, whether it be the EOS legal entity in the future that perhaps does this on behalf of, of all users, we need to, to ensure that the mechanisms around the procurement directive allow all the potential beneficiaries who may wish to benefit from these EOSC resources can do so. Um, and that's supported by the legislation that exists in, in relation to procurement. There is, there is a sort of a follow on question that uh, segues into that from Carmelo. Um, Carmelo asks about uh, if Jean procured under the Dutch law. Uh, Hilko, I don't know if you want to take that or if you want me to, to cover that. Well, you, you may correct me, uh, Paul, if I answer this incorrectly, but I think the answer is in, in this particular case, no, that was under UK law, or more precisely, I have that written down um, somewhere. It, it, it's under UK law, I think specifically yeah. the rules of England and Wales from the top of my head. So um, for, for, to, 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 to build on that, there's um, the EC procurement directive that's in place uh, when the 2016 IAS frameworks were awarded. The procurement was carried out um, by Giant in the UK at that time. Um, so the UK public procurement regulations were followed. The contracts that resulted the frameworks uh, were governed by the laws of England and Wales. Um, the current OCRA procurement that's underway is actually being done under the uh, laws of the Netherlands, the procurement regulations of the Netherlands and the frameworks that will result 
will actually be subject to the laws of Ireland. Uh, the call downs that are used by institutions, demand aggregators to procure resources on behalf of uh, users, they can be under the governing law of the uh, the country in which they reside. So there's a number of different parameters there. There's the, the procurement legislation, the relevant procurement legislation that's enforced, different member states, and that depends on who's carrying out the procurement or the aggregated procurement. Um, but the actual governing law of the contract can also vary as well. Okay. Helga, thank you very much. We'll carry on uh, with the, the agenda now. Uh, we're just going to move into the quick summary of the uh, conclusions. Um, sorry, apologies. Let me just pause a second. A couple of questions are coming as I was, I was talking. So let me just check there. Um, Okay, there's one here. Very nice for the experiments of different procurement approaches from the three approaches presented, which is more cost effective in terms of investment against long short term return, which approach is good for which scenarios, any comparison analysis results or recommendation. Okay, team, anyone like to pick that up? Questions clearly, clearly, clearly scared some of our colleagues. In terms of the structure of, of, of D12.2 at the moment and, and our way of working, we haven't done a horizontal comparison of the, the procurement approaches per se. Um, what we're looking in these case studies, if you recall, as I presented earlier, is, is a number of parameters, how it relates to procurement, how it relates to cost eligibility, how it re relates to VAT. Um, and I think the reality is that for a successful and efficient and effective EOSC of the future, whether you put that under what's uh, the working title called EOSC Exchange, I would expect there's going to be a variety of these tools and methodologies applied, depending on who the user is, what the aggregation of demand is, whether it's a niche service, whether it's a competitive market, um, how universal the service is. So I don't think there's possible to necessarily draw a conclusion, one which is better than another. You have different tools for different jobs. Um, I don't think our report will, will do a direct comparison in that respect. What it will do is identify the relative merits against those criteria that we've identified. Okay, there's a couple more questions that are coming, so let's pick up of these. Okay, there's a question from Carmela here. Do you have any document of reference comparing pros and cons of these different national procurement legislation? Um, I can talk there from work that's been done at length and in particular from the experience of Giant when it legally restructured from a UK entity into a, into a, a Dutch entity and moving from UK public procurement law to uh, Dutch public procurement law. Whilst all member states uh, incorporate or enact the EC directive on procurement, each member state has a particular flavour and implementation of that. So there certainly are some variances. Um, we don't have an inventory of how that compares on a, on a, on a, a pan-European basis for each member state. Uh, we have some working knowledge from myself and others involved in projects like OCRA of the differences between the, uh, the procurement legislation in Ireland, for example, the Netherlands uh, and the UK, um, but that's not been documented. Okay, a couple more questions. I think there's one that's come up here. I don't know if it's been answered by subsequent chats. Uh, any thoughts how to recover capital investments now excluded from the virtual access scheme? Sergio, I don't know if you want to pick up on that. Yes, on this one, okay. Partial uh, uh, improvement would come with a unit cost that has been introduced uh, for the next calls. And anyway, it would be, um, does need to be piloted with the next project, like the Infraeosk 7, all the six subtopics are able to, to use that mechanism. And we need to see uh, what the experience will be, because not all uh, service providers are find useful or applicable to use the unit cost. 
uh, for instance, some parts like uh, some uh, feedback I got, some more say I had uh, some example of thematic services who said, I need people maybe to operate the portal or to support users, the new users. So I need just PMs. And, um, and that the unique cost is not applicable to them. And um, so we need to see the experience and also we provided this feedback to the European Commission for further improving the mechanism, looking forward to uh, Horizon Europe. So that would be interesting to see how this next round of experience will be reflected then in the next framework program. Thanks, Sergio. And I see Matty you've provided some, some text response as well. Did anything you want to add further to that? Or happy with the, the text responses? Okay, you're muted at the moment, Matty. Anything you want you want to add further? Oh, sorry, it was for me. Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, this is basically for the for the follow-up projects. I, th I think uh, this is something that, uh, as Sergio said, we we need to see how it works. Thank you. Okay, we'll carry back on with the, the agenda as planned. We're running just about on time. Um, conclusions then. Um, so thank you very much for listening to uh, what we've shared with you in terms of the methodology of the, the approach for this task and uh, some of the uh, feelings or, or outcomes that we're included within this written report. The work is still being produced uh, at the moment. Uh, we're coming towards uh, producing a, a final draft and Sergio will, will explain how that's going to be disseminated um, shortly. From this perspective of a research or institutional demand aggregator, we think there's some uh, opportunities for embracing or ensuring there's that knowledge used by the sustainability working group, other relevant uh, governance activities within EOSC as the project progresses. And we hope there's some value that can be uh, incorporated there. So these points, there's lessons learned from the case studies and the application of relevance with regards to funding rules, VAT compliance, procurement legislation can be uh, incorporated so that, that, that they're designed into rather than learnt from in implementation. Of course, the things that we've shared here have hopefully have stimulated some of your thoughts because we recognise this, of course, as we've seen from the, the chat window, the uh, AII implications, just as one example, there, there's a lot of interdependencies uh, working. Uh, we can't just look at this as a silo activity. So uh, the one slide perhaps to, to move on to here is just four points really in, in aggregate and summary uh, wanted to, to stress and highlight, uh, encapsulate the, the, some key messages. First one, this is uh, the, the task that we've been given is very much to look around the use of vouchers and how vouchers can be used as a value add mechanism to ensure the distribution access to research resources and services. We've seen from the case studies this with some clear understanding tooling systems, they can be of value. Where they will be of value is perhaps not a universal application, but there is a particular requirement with this VAT directive 1065 for anybody that wants to look it up um, that the VAT treatment works in a different way. So the process and the systems required to record and capture that information and have systems that are capable of processing that at volumes if we're dealing with long tail of science users. So high volumes of users is a very much key characteristic that needs to be accommodated. In respect to virtual access, this uh, option to tick in your, in your funding agreement to use it as a basis of cost eligibility to recover your cost to allow for an arrangement where one public body can sell services to another public body is in principle a good thing there's a, a full-on benefit for that as well that if the services become free at the point of use there is no procurement per se that's going on which can help solve any procurement directive uh, obligations that the parties have as well now, it's not to say that there are some challenges, whether they're capex costs, how the services can be sized and dimensioned. Um, so there's a one case study that we've used there, uh, in particular around virtual access. We've heard from the chat window, there are others who are using virtual access as a mechanism as well. It certainly has a place, as I described before, we envisage this tool set being used by EOSC and it will hopefully have some application. In particular, the uh, scenario of demand aggregation 
has positive benefits. Uh, there's the IS framework that's been used now for a number of years, and the expenditure that's going through those frameworks is uh, is one its way to, to 30 million um, worth of, of, of revenue to support institutions all across Europe. Um, so we foresee that as being a, a positive example of such an arrangement. We just need to make sure that it's fit for purpose at perhaps a scale where maybe the EOSC legal entity uh, through EOSC exchange or an act within the EOSC program undertakes this demand aggregation. So uh, that was some petitioning working with the EC to ensure that we have the support that when a, a procurement process is initiated and conducted, that that description will hold scrutiny with the legal systems of all member states to ensure that those wishing to consume through those frameworks or those wishing to let the frameworks have a position of of comfort, credibility, that the construct is compliant with those procurement directives. The final one, again, uh, here picking up largely on a, on a procurement consideration, uh, we've got all the VAT overheads as well to, to, to consider. We heard yesterday from the Dilinga project uh, where VAT was a, a point in transacting across borders, how that system, that process and the overhead needs to be built into there. But in particular, where one public sector body wishes to sell to another public sector body, um, if they're subject to procurement directives, there are certainly uh, regulations, considerations or circumstances under which they can do that. Uh, we have a space for such a case study. We haven't yet completed that, but that's, uh, that's something that we in, intend to include in our report. So before we move into next steps, just to explain how you as a community can actively contribute, access our deliverable 12.2 before it then progresses into a, to a final deliverable 12.3. Um, Sergio will, 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 will explain that, that process to you. Uh, we very much welcome input. Um, just take the, a couple of moments now before we progress just to check if there are any other further questions that will come in. If not, I'll hand over to, uh, to Sergio just to, to wrap up and uh, describe the next step. So let's have a quick look at the, the questions, the chat. But it stimulated some uh, discussion about vouchers, virtual access, um, some knowledge and understanding sharing for, for others there. Uh, perhaps it's a first time for some reading the comments there that have learned about this mechanism and what can be done. Okay, so I'll, uh, on behalf of myself and the presenters of the, of the case studies, thank you very much for your time and, and interest and interaction. Um, Sergio, the floor is yours. Perhaps if you can describe to those listening what will happen next. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Uh, okay, I just have one slide as a main summary to, um, to tell you how, what are the next steps in terms of World Package 12 and in terms of producing our results and making them available. And also to give you an opportunity to have access to reports that you can comment on. So first of all, what you saw today is basically is the bulk of the uh, content of what will be documented in the deliverable 12.2. And this deliverable is due to the C in October. Anyway, we thought about having an, a, a public draft version for the community to comment on and also for the EOSC Sustainability Working Group. And we aim to publish this on the 8th of June. So on the 8th of June, there will be a public version and then we aim to follow the same, the same process like done by the EOS Secretariat. There will be an online form with key questions and you will be invited, you will have a time window to uh, read the document, provide your feedback, and then we will uh, work on incorporating your suggestions for improvements for the final version that we give to the EC. So if you want to, this, okay, the availability of this document will be announced in the EOSC Hub website. Anyway, if you want to receive a direct uh, notification, feel free to drop me an email about this. Uh, so, okay, this will be the most immediate step. We have another step uh, by looking forward to the end of June. Uh, work package 12 and the task studio three of the project. Task studio three is about uh, governance sustainability. I'm working on a joint collaboration because the sustainability working group had worked in the past on the Federal core. 
and we will work more on the wider let's say uh, service of recruitment and procurement models that could be applicable into the in the EOSC in the various elements so we are gonna do a next step together and we want to do a joint work for which we will produce an internal report to the EOSC sustainability working group and we are trying to align to the main EOS governance uh, milestones uh, so to make sure that what we do is useful to inform the governance on the main decision we we'll take this year on how to shape the European Open Science Cloud. Uh, so that will be the June uh, step. In October, we will uh, deliver the final output on a version of the 12.2 to the European Commission, and this will be available for everybody. And then we have a third task of this uh, work package, which is mainly about evaluating the whole experience and defining recommendations for the way forward. And so there will be a separated deliverable for this. We are discussing in EOSCAB a possible extension of the project of three months. So the project is expected to end at the end of December. We may postpone it until of March. If we postpone it at the end of March, this deliverable will be aligned with the end of the project will go to March, otherwise it will be in December. So the idea is to have more space to digest the experience, also uh, sourcing information from uh, those organizations who are working on uh, the preparation of the project and uh, which deadline is in June. So we can incorporate all this learning for the next months into this final uh, document. And that's, okay, these are the main uh, milestones. And uh, for this, uh, yeah, we can summarize basically uh, here, we, here you have the list of the team working on the 12.2, the partners, and uh, as a lead contact, if you want to have further questions following this work, you can email me and I will pass the information to, to the team. So we'll end back to in case there's any questions. Thanks, Sergio. No further questions at this time. Just check with the panel in case there's anybody that uh, wanted to add anything further. Otherwise, we'll. Uh... Okay. In which case, Diego, thank you. Our, uh, our session here is concluded. Perfect. Thank you, everybody. And uh, yes, now there will be the lunch break and uh, you can come back here and connect uh, after the break uh, for the next session that will be uh, uh, 14 and 30, so half past uh, two. Thank you. Thank you all for your attention. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank we'll you. see you over, over lunch for a, uh, a chat about some of the things that we raised here. The link naturally is the same for everyone, so you can find it on the agenda on the USCAP.